what I did agree with our uh, carnivore MD uh, was that, okay, so my ancestral mothers and fathers, the Brunhilde and Beowulfs uh, of thousands of years ago. Uh, so during the summer, you know, Brunhilde was out there getting plants and we were having uh, a lot of uh, non-poisonous leaves uh, and some tubers and a lot of dirt and some small animals that she was catching in the nets. Beowulf was out there getting the bigger game and bringing that back. And then during the winter, I wasn't eating many plant materials. And I was either not eating or I was eating uh, carnivore. So I was willing to admit that certainly uh, several months out of every year, I was either fasting or being a carnivore. And at least, you know, seven months to nine months out of the year, I was clearly an omnivore. That is what we have the most historical precedent with as, a, as uh, homo sapiens. Are, are being omnivores, just very occasionally carnivores, and uh, fairly occasionally uh, having to fast. Hey, let me, on that same subject, let, let me give you another question. Um, so my wife and I, you know, will eat, you know, our meal at dinner because that's, quite frankly, when we're both home. We both work. And, yeah, same here. And so what, what say you that really, if we were going to do this correctly, we should eat our meal at breakfast and then start our fast at that point? Well, um, again, let's sort of think about Beowulf and Brunhilde back there about 100,000 years ago. You know, uh, Beowulf was out there hunting, and so he's going to come back uh, in the afternoon with his uh, brothers uh, and cousins, etc. And they'll probably be showing up around one o'clock. Then I'm making, I'm cooking that stuff. So maybe at best I'm eating two or three o'clock. So I bet we have probably a longer history of the feast mid-afternoon. And that's when we ate. And we probably had one meal a day. I, I mean, the, the concept of three meals a day was a newly introduced uh, European dictum to separate themselves from the savages. And my guess is, historically, we probably had one meal a day. When we were farmers, we became farmers uh, 10,000 years ago, we might have had a meal before going out and doing the farm work. You've slaved all day in the fields, working your tail off, and you come back in and you uh, have another meal in the evening. So we might have had two meals a day. But when we were hunting and gathering, it was one meal. Okay. And it was probably uh, late afternoon, uh, mid-afternoon at the earliest. Yeah, as I tell my patients, we didn't crawl out of our cave and say, what's for breakfast? Yeah, well, we had to go catch it. Yeah, and break fast means break fast, and yeah. it's when we found it. Uh, the other thing that interests me is, as you know, uh, our cortisol levels rise early in the morning, uh, around, starting around 4 o'clock in the morning, and that actually kicks up our blood sugar. And my argument to people saying breakfast is the most important meal of the day would be that we seemingly have an evolutionary fix for the fact that we weren't going to have food early in the day because cortisol you know, makes us insulin resistant and it kicks up our blood sugar and we're actually off and running. So I, all my diabetic patients, I actually say, haven't you noticed that your blood sugar goes up early in the morning? And they go, yeah. And I said, well, believe it or not, that's on purpose. And you were, yeah. you were designed for this. So the idea that we've got to get that meal in first thing that we wake up, just, it doesn't make any physiologic sense. No, no, I don't, I don't think there's any need for that. All right. Um, so, like I say, you, you change your ideas, bless your heart. <laughs> what have you learned about the microbiome that you didn't know five years ago? Um, that my colleagues are really getting excited about uh, our microbiome, that uh, they admit we don't really know what species we should have in our microbiome. Uh, even my microbiome scientist admits that he doesn't know what species are the right species to have. 
that probably it's what these species can do. Uh, and that, you know, microbes are, are gene swapping all of the time. Uh, and so even though we may have these probiotics because they're being cultured uh, in these big steel vats, they're gene swapping all the time, we don't know what processes that microbe can do. And it's the processes that I need, not the name of the species. Uh, so th the research that is really the, the most interesting is the research that looks at the metabolites, the metabolome. Um, and we've got that frozen. So, so, so we're going to be uh, analyzing that. Uh, Metabolon uh, looks at about 20,000 different compounds that are in your urine, your blood, your poop, uh, your spinal fluid, and sees how that changes. Uh, so it's going to be, we're writing grants now, so hopefully there'll be a time when I'm going to be able to analyze the changes in our uh, blood, urine, and stool as people adopt the Walls diet or as they adopt any of the other diets that we study. Uh, and b because you see, that is what I think the change in the diet that you advocate and that I advocate that our, our gut then you know, digests that foods into smaller compounds that get into our bloodstream that help us run the chemistry of life. And it's, it's the microbiome making these metabolites that influence our health. So that's very exciting. I, I talk about that uh, in the book. We are writing grants. Hopefully in the next uh, couple of years, we will you know, get funded, be able to analyze that stuff. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully uh, in 2021 or 2022, I can begin to much more specifically address that. Fantastic. Uh, you're famous for advising people to eat nine cups of vegetables a day. Now, yeah, yeah. now most people equate, because of dietary advice, fruits and vegetables as equally healthy and because fruits taste good and vegetables yes. don't, they tend to head for the fruits. Uh, yeah. In your new book, you uh, aren't particularly wild about fruit. And as you know, I have told people to give fruit the boot. So what say you? So our fruit is very, very different. It's been uh, cultivated to have a lot more starch, uh, have a lot uh, higher fructose content. Uh, and so that's very different than the type of fruits that would have been uh, our ancestors would have consumed. Uh, for them, berries uh, would have been you know, like this huge treat, uh, a very seasonal treat. You could have that. Uh, and it uh, probably does not have nearly the amount of lectins because the plants want us to eat the fruit, so they aren't going to be as noxious towards it. True. The uh, fruits that we have cultivated and created, again, have so much more fructose, so many more carbs, uh, and, and frankly, so do a lot of the starchy vegetables. So what I've discovered in my clinics and our clinical trials is that People ramped up on the fruit and did not have near the amount of vegetables that I wanted them to have. So I've, I've made it much more explicit that we're uh, dialing down uh, the fruit. And my preference is that what we're talking about uh, ideally are, are berries. I think berries are the most beneficial uh, of the fruit. Uh, it's so much more important to get the greens, to get the sulfur, and a small amount of fruit. If you have a belly that's bigger than your butt, then I'd rather you not have any fruit. And that's, that's most Americans, unfortunately. Unfortunately, that is most Americans. And unfortunately, most children now, too. Uh, you know, that's true. 